Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us to hear about the role of proteomics in understanding uh, COVID-19. Today, we're joined by Professor Dr. Marcus Rauser to discuss his work in this area. As always, we're using our Slack channel for questions and discussions, so please join us there to ask questions, share any thoughts and discuss the work. Um, Slack helps us uh, to prioritize the questions that others also want to hear the answers to. So if you can use the thumbs up to let us know those questions that you'd like to hear answered, uh, that will really help us direct them towards Marcus. And uh, Slack also allows the speakers to answer any other questions or follow up after the talks are finished. So just some more housekeeping stuff. Uh, for those needing an attendance certificate for this webinar, the details will be available uh, on how to get this after the uh, final slide has finished for this talk. And once again, we'd like to say a really big thank you to the European Proteomics Association, the British Society for Proteome Research, Young Proteomics Investigators Club, and the London Proteomics Discussion Group Committee for their help and support in setting up this webinar. Thanks also to the London Biological Mass Spectrometry Discussion Group, the London Metabolic Metalab Metabolomics Network, and the News in Proteomics Research blog for promoting this event. Um, we're also really grateful for Imperial College London for providing us with the webinar support and a huge thank you to Marcus for um, sharing his time with us today. We're also pleased to announce that our next webinar in this series will be on Friday the 26th of June at two o'clock British summer time fe featuring Dr. Christian Munch talking about his latest work on how growth factor receptor signaling inhibition prevents SARS-CoV-2 replication. So today we'll be hearing from Professor Dr. Marcus Rauser, Einstein Professor of biochemistry and head of department of biochemistry at the Charité University Medicine in Berlin in Germany, and also senior group leader at the Francis Crick Institute here in London. The Rouser Group is recipient of a substantial funding by the Crick, the Wellcome Trust, the ERC, EMBO and the BMBF in Germany, as well as the Max Planck Society and the BBSRC. Marcus was selected into the Young, EMBO Young Investigator Programme, and he is also a Wellcome Trust BIDE Fellow, as well as the recipient of a number of prestigious awards, too many to list here. His lab is known for the fundamental discoveries that have improved our understanding of how cells can coordinate hundreds of biochemical bi reactions assembled in the metabolic network and for the development of high throughput mass spectrometry technologies. Today, we're gonna to hear how he's applied those technologies to the discovery of clinical classifiers of COVID-19 infection. So it's over to you, Marcus, if you want to take over. Don't forget to unmute yourself. <laughs> Yeah, Joe, uh, thanks so much for this uh, almost overly kind introduction. So I hope many of you had the chance to join a few minutes before you because you could hear a free gig from the clash uh, over the channel. And during it, I couldn't keep stop thinking how they would look like if they would need to sing these days with all these uh, face masks on. So anyway, welcome. So like, it should be my control now. I should be able to uh, uh, change the slides, yeah. So I'm gonna speak a little bit about COVID-19 research uh, today, uh, but I'm a, a biotechnologist slash mass spectrometrist as many of you in the audience. So the focus will be mostly about this topic and hopefully um, uh, I can also provide you some little insights about uh, our work in, in the COVID-19 situation. Um, great, so um, <clears throat> before going there, I would like to give you a little bit an introduction that explains but our main topic of research is, and that also explains how we got into the situation of developing high throughput uh, proteomic and metabolomic methods. So our main uh, scientific topic that we address in the lab is this metabolic network. So and many of you have seen different illustrations of metabolic networks over the time, and the older ones among us, they, they know these Beringer charts that we put on walls when, when we were students and more modern generations of scientists have seen something like tech and networks like the one I illustrate on this slide here. Now, all of those illustrations, they have something in common. Uh, they make look metabolism very big and very scary. And specifically, it's scary for our undergrad students. And so typically, that's what I try to do when I start my undergrad lectures. I show them metabolic network maps to really scare them off of joining my lab. Now, that's a joke because actually, despite those networks um, look complicated, they're actually very simple. So they gain their complexity by a huge number of uh, reactions that participate in these networks, but much fewer reactions compared to what chemistry could provide. 
And the second thing is this network is hugely conserved. So we don't have the knowledge from a single species, actually experimental knowledge to assemble a full metabolic network. So all we know comes from studying many, many different species, many different enzymes over a century of research. And just the sheer fact that this is possible already tells you how conserved the whole structure is. No? So we have a network which is much simpler as it could be, and which is made up of single units which are highly conserved. And so this already tells you there are rules uh, behind this metabolic network. And we are in my lab after some of those rules and we try to explain why those networks uh, look the way they do. Okay, so a few years back, um, I come from a classic um, yeast systems biology kind of background. We said, well, it would be great if we want to understand it, this network that we would have one species where we would know about the function of every single gene in the genome in metabolism. And uh, obviously, as a metabolism lab, you first think about quantifying metabolites. Yeah? And we said, OK, we have yeast. Um, yeast is a very useful model. And at the time, yeast um, had lots of very good uh, genetic resources. And one of those resources that we really like is a, a knockout collection. So it's a collection of about 5,000 strains. Um, that's about the size of the non-essential genome of, of yeast, of Saccharomyces yeast, I have to add here. And so we have nicely arrayed a collection of those strains and in every single well, there is the same background with one gene deleted. And so we thought we can use this resource to learn about the regulation of metabolism. And so we established some medium to high throughput protocols in which we could cultivate uh, all of those strains in multi-well plates and where we can at a relatively good throughput extract metabolites. And then we had to use some analytics to quantify which metabolites are in these extracts and in this way assemble the matrix. And one thing we learned over time in working on large scale projects is that a quantification precision and measurement quality is something extremely important. No? I mean, in a small scale experiment, you might still get away if your measurement is noisy or if you're, uh, you have batch effects or things are not very consistent. But the moment you scale it up, you risk very much to measure a lot of noise. So it was very important for us in our first uh, large scale studies that we work with on analytics, which is very reproducible, very precise. And what we ended up doing is to not quantify a very big bunch of metabolites at the same time, but we decided to look at amino acids. Uh, amino acids because they're very informative about metabolism A and B, and because they are relatively straightforward to quantify, I admit this. And so we made a MIM method, so selective reaction monitoring, running on a triple quad at a time, and this has a runtime of less than three minutes. So this was very important for us uh, to uh, be able to walk through large sample numbers, and also which gives a very nice separation chromatographically for the amino acids, and in the end of the day, this allowed us to quantify um, uh, those metabolites with heavy wide precision across the strains. So long story short, what did we get to? We ended up with a huge matrix, obviously, which spans over 5,000 yeast knockouts, all from the same background, all grown to a very similar condition in the same media, and um, versus the concentration of 19 of the 20 proteinogenic amino acids. And then you can do many things with such a matrix. You can do simple descriptive analysis and ask which are the genes, which drive metabolism, which are the transporters, which are the transcription factors, what are the most important categories, what are the least important ones. But also you can try to uh, get functional information about the cell. And this is something which excited us a lot. So what you can see already on this simple uh, heat map here is that although it's very, very small, of course, to see details, you can appreciate there are clusters in this heat map. Huh? And relatively quickly, we realized that these clusters uh, correspond to shared gene function. So simple example, if one gene affects the mitochondrium and another gene affects the mitochondrium as well, both of them most likely have a similar metabolic signature. And this allowed us to use those metabolic signatures to uh, identify also functions for genes which hadn't had a functional annotation before. And just to give you one example how this looks like. So this here um, uh, is the structure of the ribosome. It looks a little bit naked because it's depicted without RNA. But what you see that the different colors here um, are the same part of the ribosome and those different colors uh, correspond to the clusters that we obtained in this amino acid matrix. Eh? So these very simple metabolic profiles were good enough not only to tell well this gene most likely plays a role in the ribosome, they could even tell when it plays a role in this substructure of the ribosome. Yeah? So this is a very nice structural resolution which you just achieve by clustering metabolomes. And this was very assuring. And so we applied this, of course, to all of the 280 clusters that we got. And it turns out that these helped us in the single experiment to make a functional prediction to about 50% of the genes in this genome 
put in had a function annotation before. Yeah? So the clustering of those systematically acquired omic profiles are very, very powerful for finding out what the gene is doing. Great, now one thing about metabolomes uh, is difficult and it is that to interpret how they get there. You know? So for most genetic perturbations, when you apply them, you are changing many metabolites at the same time. Um, and so it's very hard to say, how do we get to this profile? No? So we can see the profile, we can cluster it, but we cannot explain. And the obvious information that we are missing, obviously, is, is the metabolic network below. We don't know how active the enzymes are and how well expressed, how highly expressed those enzymes are and how this changes. Now, measuring hundreds of enzyme activities at the same time in thousands of strains is something which didn't work 10 years ago and is something which probably doesn't work properly the next few years as well. So this was an option. Yeah? And, but the other thing we thought is possible. Now we can quantify the enzymes. We can use proteomics. We can use quantitative proteomics applied and see how do enzyme expression patterns relate to the metabolomes in these knockouts that we get. Okay, so a few years back, we didn't have the capacity to run uh, proteomes at a very large scale, but we thought we have a chance to get there. And so what we had available is a, a previous generation uh, QTOF instrument from Sykes. It was a triple of 5600, and we had coupled it to a microflow LC. Originally for some other intention, but we said, okay, we got some rumors that microflow might be good enough to do proteomics, and we said, okay, and let's see how far we get. So we made a 30 minute water to acetonitrile gradient, made some triplic digestive how yeast, and, and applied this to, to our proteomes. And so what we got out of it is something which for the time already was not super deep. So it's 800 uh, proteins, so it's about a fifth about what we typically could quantify in a yeast proteome, but we could get this at a very high precision and in 30 minutes time. Yeah? So this was quite important for us. Now, the second thing is we were very lucky because being interested in metabolism, we mostly had to deal with metabolic enzymes and many of the metabolic enzymes are highly abundant in the cell and they are globular and soluble. Yeah? So we, without having planned it, we indirectly were lucky. So we enriched in this data set for metabolic enzymes. And indeed, um, these 800 proteins that we quantify capture 75% of the enzymatic uh, reactions that we believe are active in a yeast cell. Yeah? And so if you now put these uh, reactions on the metabolic map of yeast, you can actually see that we probably capture much more because the things we don't see, they cluster together and the things we see, they cluster together. So probably it's not 75%, they probably get something close to 90, 95% of the relevant enzymatic reactions that we capture in a yeast cell. And, and so this was not good. So then we said, okay, we have now a method which has a reasonable throughput. Think about this is five years uh, back in time yeah, and which could be applied to get a large scale overview of metabolism. Now, with a 30 minute chromatographic gradient, you cannot run thousands of proteomes, but you can run hundreds of them. So we had to find a solution, a subset of the genome that we could analyze and say, look, what can we quantify to get with a, a selected number of these strains the information we need? And we ended up looking at protein kinases. Yeah? So there are about 100 protein kinase genes in yeast, a bit more actually, but some of them are essential. So it's about 100 non-essential protein kinases in yeast. And so it's a large gene family, important for us because we needed a lot of samples. At the same time, we all know that kinases are important. So we expected that they do some impact to the cell. And the third thing, they were not metabolic enzymes in the classic sense themselves, which means we are not perturbing the structure of the metabolic network if we, um, if we delete a kinase. Okay, so that's why we ended up working with kinases. So to create a proteome before 100 strains, of course, means you need more than 100 samples. In this case, we we sampled them in triplicates, we had lots of controls, so this made already something like 500 proteomes. No? And at that time, 500 proteomes was still a huge amount of work, so probably we measured for five, six months on this uh, data set together. Okay, now there were some surprises in there and I would like to share one or two of them that still um, um, keep me thinking about. So the first thing was that we thought, well, um, uh, kinases uh, are important for regulatory processes, so I naively thought we will find some kinases that are important for metabolism and some kinases which will be not important for metabolism. Yeah? And this uh, turned out to be quite naive because what we found is that every single kinase is important for metabolism. Yeah? So you cannot make a distinction to what's important and not important, you can just say how broadly important something is. And indeed, there are some map kinases over here, which can affect more than 150 enzyme abundances at the same time. 
that's a lot, that's one fifth of the entire metabolic network of the cell. And there are some other kinases which probably affect the five or 10 enzymes, but this also doesn't mean this is not important because this could be some quite key enzymes. Yeah? So every single kinase plays its role in enzyme abundance. So this was the first message. Second message was they are not just abundant, they're hugely important. Yeah, and so this comes out when you now look at absolute quantities. So this red line tells you the absolute enzyme quantity of the cell, how it's affected by a single kinase deletion. And there are some which have in total uh, a neutral impact because some enzymes go up and some enzymes go down. But there are some others which do a dramatic change. So there is this one kinase here, AKL1. If you delete this one, it's 25% of the total enzyme mass of the cell which is affected. Yeah? So there is a huge impact of those kinds. So this was the first conclusion. And second conclusion was that things are more complicated uh, when it comes to regulation as, as, as we thought or probably other people thought too. And this is a little bit seen here. So this is now a correlation matrix. Each correlation here is an entire proteome against an entire proteome. So not an, one enzyme, it's an entire uh, enzyme signature basically against each other. And what you see is that most of it is in quite light colors. Either it's white or light blue or light red. And this means the overlap in signatures. And what you can appreciate is that this means is that most kinase knockouts have the very unique signature in enzyme. Yeah? It's a bit different to what we thought. We thought, well, we have signaling pathways, and if we hit multiple kinases that are part of the same signaling pathway, they should give a very similar enzyme expression signature, but we didn't see this. We see that every kinase is important and does a different thing. Okay. This meant then that probably we have a problem with the signaling pathway concept in the moment we want to explain how metabolic enzyme abundance regulation works. And just a teaser about this, but I found this still, still surprising. No, and so we first asked, OK, if you now take uh, signaling pathways, they are well annotated in these, but not for the regulation of metabolism. This is what I had to add. Yeah? And ask how well predictive they are. Now, if you download all of them from CAC or if you download all of them from Reactome, you first get a value which sounds reasonable. <clears throat> so it looks like that the pathways as we have them explain about 50% of the coenzyme expression variation as we detected in the problem. Um, the problem is you get very similar values if you randomly assemble the kinases into totally invented signaling pathways which don't exist in nature. So with total random pathways, we get to very, very similar values as we get with the entire um, annotations of signaling pathways. And so this points out that this definition of a linear signaling system uh, works probably very well for, for some developmental decisions, but when it comes to the regulation of enzyme abundances, this definition is not sufficient. So we need to look at every single kinase individually, which target it has and how it works. Okay, now for us, the bigger question was, now how can we use this to explain metabolism? And um, just very short, um, we found out that we can take into account the structure of metabolism that we knew about, map the proteomes on top of it, and this enables us then to predict metabolism. Just to show an example here how this works. So this is ADP. It's an adenosine nucleotide. Um, many of you know it from energy metabolism. It's a, obviously a very important metabolite in the cell. And because it's important, it's connected to many enzymes. And among those enzymes that we quantify are 50 that metabolize ADP. Yeah? So what we then do is we make a, a simple linear model which connects an abundance change in all of the enzymes that we quantify to the concentration change of ADP that we quantify with our metabolomics method. And then we run those of all of the knockouts where we have proteomes and metabolomes for, and we select those interactions which become predictive. Now, it's a multilinear regression problem, um, very simple. And we end up with a linear model which takes into account all significant relationships. And the question is how well can this simplistic approach then um, predict the concentration of a metabolite? And turns out it works decently well. So this is now an example here for ADP, but also ATP and the MP quantified in the 100 kinase knockouts and predicted over a simple multilinear regression model as here. And what you see is that you actually achieve a relatively good predictive value um, of the metabolite concentration out of the proteomes in the moment you know this network structure. Yeah? So and after we had completed this exploratory uh, part, we said now it's time to go ahead. Can we now go away from individual metabolites and can we go to the prediction of entire metabolomes 
that's of course more complicated and needs more data, but in the end of the day, the principle is very similar, just that we train not simply linear models, but machine learning algorithms over the metabolic network structure. And what we achieved is a, a relatively good prediction of the entire metabolomes uh, that we have in the kinase knockouts. Yeah? So in the end of the day, if you know the network structure, you can start to link proteomes and metabolomes quite well, and even predict a complex phenotype as an entire metabolome for it. Okay, <clears throat> now, and this was now few years back, so we got very excited because we said, actually, what we need really to understand metabolism is partially metabolite concentrations, but what we really need to know is the concentration of the enzymes. Yeah? So, and this uh, triggered a lot of research activities in my lab, and one uh, outcome of this was a high throughput proteomics pipeline, which now does much better as these 30 minute microflow gradients that we have five years ago. Yeah, so and I give you now some of the key indicators of this platform. It's now automated. Yeah? We have built it in a containment level two that we can both work with yeast samples, pathogenic yeast samples, but also human samples, as I will show you uh, in a few slides. And uh, we have moved uh, every step to an automated system. We have two liquid handling robots, both come from Beckman, in our case, that, that do the job. Um, and Christoph, um, who was deleted, and many, many key members in the lab have spent a lot of time to reduce the handling time in our protocol. So we have now for our entire proteomic workflow about 1.5 hours hands-on time per 96 well plate. Um, we, we have found another trick, which is very simple, but very effective. And this is that most um, high throughput proteomic workflows, which are out there, um, and there people always pipette the next reagent on top of the previous solution. Yeah? And this is very fine if you manually pipette, and that's also very good if you have a small sample number. But if you have a very big study to run, which may run over months or years, that's a problem, because each time you re-prepare your reagents, you change them slightly and you introduce batch effects. And so we have designed the whole workflow that we have uh, different um, reagent plates. We pre-fill the reagent plates um, when we start the project. It could be a project of 10,000 samples. So then we meet, meet, we make hundreds of plates of the reagents. We freeze them at minus 80, and then we thaw them, and these plates enter the workflow at different stages. And so what we never do is to pipe it a single reagent on top of it, but we always transfer the previous step into the next one. And this massively reduces our batch effects. Wait, and then we had to optimize our data acquisition and data processing scheme to get very fast. And that's what I would like to uh, show you partially in the rest of the talk. Yeah? OK, so the first key thing was uh, that we wanted to get um, faster with our data independent MASPEC acquisition method. Yeah, I mentioned before that we use SWOFMS, we, we worked about with 30 minute gradients. And as many of you know, if you make the gradients much shorter, is that the sensitivity of a classic mass spec pipeline collapses. Yeah? You don't identify true positives anymore. And um, a hand-waving explanation that many people say is, well, um, uh, we lose sensitivity. Uh, but what actually happens is that the data becomes too complex, that the classic uh, software is no longer able to deconvolute it. And uh, Vadim, who is a very talented uh, computational postdoc in the lab, he, he noticed this and he started to invent new algorithms which are better dealing with highly convoluted data, which comes from short chromatographic gradient. Yeah? And um, the software which came out of it is called Diane. Um, it's, a, it's a software package runs on various kind of computers. It's specifically optimized for large scale projects that like to run short gradients. So it's written in a way that you can nicely scale it, that you can run thousands of, of samples with it even on a on a moderate hardware. And in particular, the advantage is that it um, has several algorithms that deconvolute the short gradient data. Partially, this is done by deep neural networks that automatically train themselves to distinguish a true positive or false positive hits. Yeah? Just to show you an example how it works. So this here is data recorded with a QExactive HFX. Uh, it's a human cell line data. And if you run a, a two hour gradient or a longer hour nanoflow gradient, so each of the software which is out there that's reasonably well. I think we, we, when it comes to true positive identifications at very strict cutoffs, I think Diane does actually pretty good there. So this is a two hour gradient that we identify about 95 to 100,000 precursors at, um, from the raw data where some other software gets less. But the real strength of the hand comes up when they get shorter. So this is the same HeLa extract now separated in 30 minutes. Again, this is classic nanoflow chromatography. And you see that Diane still gets 50,000 true positive hits out of the same raw data where you have a complete collapse of the other software which was available to us on the market. Yeah, so, so Diane is, is our trick to 
to be able to, to work with shoulder gradients. A second thing is then once we had the end is said, well, now it's actually time to, to think if we really need um, microflow or nanoflow chromatography, or if we can even go faster and use our metabolomics type high flow chromatography for proteomic experiments. No, the reason is obvious. So high flow chromatography is very stable. You can easily run uh, thousands of samples over the same column. You have much shorter inter runtime overlaps because columns equilibrate faster. You have less carryover. And we said, well, it would be a dream if we could get rid of many of our problems, if we could just get rid of, you know, microflow chromatography and work with, with high flow. Now, so we ended up after extensive optimization actually with a workflow, which is, which is quite reasonable. I show you some characteristics at the end of the talk, but just some key things here. So we work with a five minute water to acetonitrite gradient. Yeah? Um, this is here a plasma sample, uh, illustrated because that's a very dirty, high dimensional data, and still you see that you don't have a carryover. So this is after that injections, there is there is literally no carryover. Um, then um, peaks become very, very good. So you have um, very sharp chromatographic peaks, and because of the very good chromatography, you increase the peak capacity. No? This is illustrated here. So if you make the ratio between, um, uh, well, the, the gradient length and the uh, peak with, um, you, you see how well this chromatography performs and that's why we achieve relatively good peak capacities now. And the status we are at the moment now is that with a five minute high flow gradient, we achieve a peak capacity. This is comparable to a 20 minute microflow chromatography as uh, we had it a few years back, uh, but using a very similar uh, column material and the particle diameters. OK, I come back at the end of the talk about the scanning mode that allows us to deconvolute these fast, uh, fast gradients. But for the time being, uh, just believe me that um, this works even in combination with a soft MS workflow to process proteomes. OK, so as this works well, it opens now many doors because with this workflow, now we can suddenly do 200 proteomic measurements on a single mass spectrometer. So this includes already the, the in-between runtime, which in our setup is about three minutes. Uh, from uh, between the injection of two samples, which is the time for washing and equilibrating the columns. And I'll just give you uh, one little example here, um, which is in line with our initial thought. So we got access to a nice collection of wild yeast strains. It's more than 1,000 wild strains. They come from all over the world. They come from natural isolations. They come from industry. They come from, from bakeries. And um, all of those strains have been genome sequenced, all of those strains have been phenotyped, and so we can link the global genetic diversity of that species to the genetic and the phenotypic variability. And so that was one of the first uh, applications of our technology. So if it switched, this is how about 1000 proteomes now, now look like. So obviously, if you're very strict in filtering the number of proteins that you consistently detect in a thousand proteomes goes, uh, goes down, but what we have left is, is quite high quality data that we can use to cluster. And this is just to illustrate a little bit that the structure um, of the proteomes tells us something about the ecology of the strains and where they come from. And those different colors here indicate what are the different groups of strains and they, in many cases, cluster together if they have similar features, like a similar ecological niche and uh, similar biotechnological properties. Okay. Um, this is a coronavirus meeting. I am aware of this, and that's why I would like now to make the jump to human samples. So, so one obvious thing was the moment we knew that we can now do thousands of yeast proteomes, that now it's a very good time also to do thousands of human proteomes. And then one strength of high flow chromatography is uh, that you um, are less susceptible to interferences also when we have like high abundant proteins like albumin in your samples. So it's a very good technology to look at clinical samples to measure plasma, to measure serum, to measure CSF. Yeah? And we established several collaborations with people that are interested in having large scale um, serum and plasma um, uh, studies. And one of them is the Generation Scotland study. Generation Scotland is a family based epidemiological study run by an exciting collaborative um, group of, of laboratories in, in Edinburgh and in Glasgow. And um, we got access to some of the individuals, and this is just data from a, from a quick um, uh, pilot experiment, actually, that we initially ran. This it covers about 200 
healthy individuals from the generations complaint study. So what you can see is this, this is now a run of 400 non-blind injections of those 200 individuals. And what you perfectly see is that the high flow chromatography pays off because you get a perfect alignment of your retention times, even in a 400 sample study. And um, matrix is of course not as uh, rich in plasma as it's in a cellar or in a yeast proteome. So we, we detect about 182 plasma proteomes into this study. But the strength of the technology comes not with the number of proteins, it comes with the completeness. Yeah? So about 85% or so of the uh, proteins we see, we see those with a 99% data completeness. Yeah? So the requirement for imputation uh, goes down dramatically and the quality of course increases because you actually measure in every individual sample at the same peptides in the same proteins. Yeah? And because of the very nice chromatography and because of the very good completeness, also the quality increases. And in this particular study, this is label free, yeah? it's not labeled. We got an average coefficient of variation of just 5% across the 400 non blank injections. And if you look for the high abundant proteins, you see that we quantify those with less than 2% coefficient of variation. So this is much more precise than everything we had previously when it comes to quantitative proteomics. Great, so this platform works now well for um, large scale um, human proteomics. And um, we were uh, starting to run now the whole generation Scotland study is about 20,000 individuals. And then we entered the lockdown and we couldn't do anything anymore except work on coronavirus. And um, I had some excellent collaboration partners now in my second life where I lead the, the, the charity biochemistry department with our virology and with our pneumology departments. And they started very early on to assemble a good cohort, a good informative cohort of COVID-19 individuals. And so we got access to a first cohort, which was comprising of about 48 patients. And the nice thing about this cohort was that it was relatively well balanced. Yeah? It's, not, it's not a big cohort, but we had um, individuals with very strong variability in their, in their grading. Um, so we grouped them eventually based on the WHO criteria and this WHO criteria describe how strong an individual is affected. So you start at a WHO grade three if a person uh, needs to be admitted to hospital. Uh, so um, for the ICU medics, they have a little bit of different scale of thinking. For those, this is still a very mild case. Um, WHO4 is still a mild case for uh, from the point of view of an uh, ICU physician, but for us normals who never see an ICU, somebody with grade 4 is an extremely sick individual. If it's a young person, it's oxygen supply. Yeah? And so based on this, they are graded until WHO7, which is the most severe critical form where somebody needs even organ support to survive. Okay. So we process those individuals over the pipeline and we are specifically looking for proteins which change the more severe uh, COVID-19 gets. And uh, it turns out the proteomes are quite informative for actually doing that assessment. And this is now a heat map of these uh, individuals here. And these are the proteins which are differentially expressed depending on the severity of uh, COVID-19. And we appreciate already here that we have a huge change uh, of, of, the, uh, of these protein abundances from a grade three, four, five, six, and seven. So these upper proteins here are the ones which, which go up and these proteins down here are the ones which go down depending on severe and those proteins are. Now, what are those proteins? <clears throat> it's, it's two big chunks. So the first chunk is proteins that have not been annotated with COVID-19 before. So those are interesting ones to learn new biology to see if there are some of them are potential therapeutic targets. And then we have two, um, uh, two key things. The, the one is the acute phase response, so immune system. And so that's of course something which is important for every viral infection because many of those create such a big problem and because they have strategies to evade the immune system. And so um, one of the key things about systematic proteomics is not only that you see the markers that show up, but also you see those markers which you can quantify which don't change. And this gives you a quite good picture about how the host response to a viral infection. And here what is a, a key outcome is that something around interleukin-4 and interleukin-6 produces a lot of targets that are in the system and that we detect with mass spectrometry. And the second thing is uh, proteins which are part of the um, coagulation system. And this is in the end of the day, which can create a problem in the severe or the critical cases of COVID-19. Okay, so these are just the three examples that you see how strong those different shades. So this is CD14. And you see that's the variation in a standard serum, that's the variation across the generation Scotland cohort. And this is how CD14 changes in coronavirus disease patients. And clearly 
gives you an indicator how strongly affected an individual is. Another example on the other end is chelsodin. It's quite interesting uh, protein here, and you see that it's quite stable in the population as well in our controls. But the moment you get a more severe COVID-19, chelsodin levels drop. Now, can you make use of this data to do some predictions? Well, this is something we are on at the moment, but to give you a teaser here, that's a very simple principle component analysis. So it's a non-supervised clustering of those individuals based on those 27 proteins. And what you see here by color is that depending on how strongly they are affected, uh, the, the more they, they differ in the first principle component, which explains 73% of the variability. Now the green here is the controls, and you see two uh, purple uh, dots here. And so those uh, uh, dots uh, belong to individuals where the physicians initially told us that those are severely affected individuals. Uh, but they did cluster very close actually to our control group, so they look very different to the clinical assessment, which was somewhere here. So we ask in these two cases, the physicians, can you look back about those individuals and check again what's, what's different to them? And it turned retrospectively out that one of them actually didn't have uh, any COVID-19, but it was infected by influenza type B, and the other individual just had a very strong chemotherapy a few days before he was admitted for a COVID-19 infection. Yeah? And so those two individuals were immediately spotted by the proteomes uh, to be different to the other group in severity. And this is what uh, our physician collaborators liked a lot because there's not a single clinical standard essay at the moment out there which could give you immediately such, a, such an assessment. And this uh, gives us hope for the future that based on proteomes you could develop such essays. Great. Um, now, and this is something we, we move into the future just very quickly. We have a much larger cohort that we are measuring now, a cohort where we also have good time trajectories and try to uh, categorize people and work towards uh, the design of clinical essays. And um, quite a few people who are in this call actually around London are helping us in this and uh, try to find some new computational methods that can be fed with the proteomic data and give us some predictions. So this is some data from, from Harry uh, and his collaborators, and basically um, you can use network-based models and create bioanalytic networks which are specific to the individual and can identify the features which are different in each individual as they would be for its severity grade. And this allows you to generate scores, and based on those scores, you hopefully can classify the patients, how they behave in the hospital, and maybe also how they behave in the future. So we are not that there yet that this is a finalized um, predictor which is applicable for the clinic, but this slide illustrate that there is a huge potential there that this could be achieved and we are working now extensively on larger cohorts um, and time projected cohorts uh, to achieve this. Okay, now <clears throat> back to technology. After all, this is a, is a mass spec audience. So where are we now? So we have a technology I presented you that we can do five minute um, data and acquisition runs. Now, those are a challenge, not because only they are short, but also because signal interferences. And the last few minutes of my talk, I would like to talk a little bit um, which developments we have made to now move this method to uh, much more deep and better proteomic methods for large scale proteomics. And we apply them obviously um, to problems like COVID-19 and to illustrate how they work. Okay, so where is the problem? So the problem is, of course, that very short chromatography, even it has desirable properties when it comes to peak capacity and resolution, and has a lot of requirement how fast a mass spec has to be. No? And the reason being is very trivial, the peaks are much, uh, eluding much faster. No? So this is a conventional nano LC peak, you may have an 18 second half maximum peak width, and then with a conventional mass spec cycle time of three seconds, you still record um, absolutely enough um, um, data points per peak. Now, if your entire peak is just three seconds, of course, you cannot do this with a duty cycle, which is three seconds long, you need to be shorter. And what we uh, believe we need is something like 500 millisecond duty cycle in order that we can work with a five minute high flow chromatography. Now, there are two ways you can reach this. And the simple thing first we did is to limit the mass range and to reduce the accumulation time to an extent uh, that it fits within 500 milliseconds, but this means that you sacrifice proteomic depth. And the second solution is that you invent a new scanning mode, which is so much faster than the previous scanning mode that you could do as you worked previously with broad peaks, just with the much shorter peaks. Yeah? And this is where we started our collaboration with Sykes, um, 
to make this happen. And the, the produce of this long running collaboration is now a method called scanning SMOF, which I will introduce to you in the next few minutes. OK, there's a second problem. Second problem is with data independent acquisition. If you go very fast, of course, your data becomes more condensed, it becomes more complex, and which means you have a bigger problem with co-selection, you have a bigger problem with signal interference. Yeah? And we also thought that we need to solve this. And scanning scoff luckily helps us to fix both problems. Now, what is scanning scoff? Sorry, I need a little bit <coughs> of water supply for my homeboys. Okay, so scanning soft um, is, is the next uh, development which bases on, on soft technology. And as many of you know, um, soft technology works by acquiring the data in Windows. And that's why it's called a data independent acquisition method because it doesn't matter which peptides come, you always scan for the same Windows. They may vary over the gradient, but that's the basic principle. Now, if you do window acquisition, you, you tune your quadruple pool for a certain amount of time on that particular window, and then you need to retune to the next, and this is what takes time. Now, what scanning swap simply does, it's no longer acquiring in windows, but it acquires in continuous scans. So in a way, it's very similar what Waters has invented with Sonar, so you have a, a scanning aperture of your quadruple pool and it continues the scans. <clears throat> and what you now can vary is two different things. You can vary the scan speed, of course, how fast you scan, but you also can tune the window. Yeah? And in this way, um, scanning sort of decouples yeah, and the duty cycle uh, from the uh, scan size because you cannot each duty cycle operate with a different variable window. Yeah? Good. And then there is a second thing which is now very nice because you have another dimension. Yeah? Imagine a precursor eludes and you scan through your precursor. While it eludes, the precursor enters your scan window and exits it. Yeah? And this adds a new dimension. It looks a little bit like a chromatogram, but it's a scanning, a scanogram or a scanning chromatogram. And this is a little bit an idealized uh, illustration of it. It more likes actually like a normal illusion chromatogram. Yeah? And so um, what is important is that this new dimension, this Q1 dimension, has the same illusion profile as your MS2 dimension, and you can overlay the two. And this means uh, you can in real time assign a MS1 signal to your MS2 signals. You can match the two. And this gives you quantification precision. So um, this here is now a human cell line. It's uh, Chi4562, which is a lymphoblast cell line acquired with a short gradient. And here it's a conventional swap. And this is now uh, with, with the Q1 score. Sorry, both is scanning swap. One is very take account uh, for the Q1 matching and the other one don't. And what you see is that the false discovery rate massively improves. So what you see here at the 1% false discovery rate, we can quantify uh, many, many more peptides if we take account into uh, the Q1 score. And this is just uh, two examples where you see. It. So um, uh, this is a true positive peptide identification and the false positive one. And if you just look at the MS2 space, you would both assign to a precursor, but only if you know about this black dotted line here, which is the Q1 dimension, you can distinguish that this one here is a true positive because the Q1 illusion profile matches with the Q2 illusion profile, but on the false positive, is this is the two things are not matching. And this is how scanning stuff improves our true positive identification rate. So now how well does it perform? We are extremely pleased how, how well it works. So these are now again five minute uh, uh, to one minute a chromatographic gradient on, on high flow. And here we compare now normal swap as you have shown uh, seen in the slides before with scanning swap. And what you can see or appreciate here is in that particular experiment, we doubled the amount of precursors that we can identify in those uh, five minute gradients now. So now the second thing is because we are now much faster in scanning, we also can make a crazily fast chromatography and try to get good proteomes out in there. And this is now a one minute water to a C to nitride gradient on a high flow system. And we still get almost 18, 19,000 of precursors uh, out of that very fast proteomic experiment. Now, of course, this is not the right technology if you want to do single cell proteomics, but it could be a really good technology if you want to screen conditions, if you want to do a drug screen, if you do a target based screen, because it really enables you to get a thousand samples or so a day to a conventional uh, mass spectrometer. Yeah? And, um, Benchmarking of those methods is, is always never easy, so I try to hide our benchmarks a little bit, but just to show how this works as a comparison. So this is a uh, data that we took from Jasper Olsen laboratory. It's also very recent from this year with a five minute EvoCept technology with uh, recorded on a Novitrap instrument with FAMES. And what you see is that uh, we, we get there more or less 
um, with one minute scanning stuff. And if we uh, use the same measurement time, we can uh, identify many more precursors on our human cell lines. And the, the good important thing is that the quantification precision is not affected. So even though we double the precursor identifications at those five minute scans, we still get the same quantification precision and the same nice distribution of CV values in our software. Okay, and um, just to conclude my presentation with the last thing, we then said, okay, can we bring it to the extreme? How fast can we now do proteomic experiments? And Christoph then played around with different uh, scanning of acquisition windows and different gradient lengths. And we, you see that even with a 30 second gradient on the high flow system, you still quantify something like 1000 precursors in a human cell extract. I mean, clearly this is not a deep proteome anymore with 1000 precursors, but it can have its applications for some people who want to run really fast. But already if you go to gradients of one or two minutes, um, you can get decent number of, of precursor identifications with these fast scanning modes. And that is very, very useful if you want to look at large human populations. So I uh, thank you very much for staying with me for this uh, 45 minutes today. So this of course is all based on huge collaborative efforts with many brilliant collaboration partners and also very brilliant postdocs and PhD students that I have in my lab to highlight two individuals who did most of the technology development that I showed you before. This is Christoph. So Christoph is an analytical chemist who set up most of the high throughput uh, pipelines that uh, we now um, uh, use and, and publish. And Vadim, he's uh, behind Diane and the way how to deconvolute those fast gradients. But obviously they are part of a very strong team. They get many input and uh, a large network of great collaborators. And just before we go to the discussion, just something on my own. As you have heard in the introduction, I recently did a move to Berlin and we built up a new department there for um, which we call systems biochemistry, where we integrate large scale data with a lot of clinical work. And uh, we are part of a new initiative in Berlin, which is a national research node of mass spectrometry. And we got funding for two independent group leader positions. So um, this is the right audience to distribute this. Most of you are mass spectrometrists. So these are fantastic packages. They fund you for five years and give you two million euros to spend. And in the end of the day, you may even be tenured. So if you are interested in the work we do, um, uh, please think about it and join us. And with these words, I head back to Joe and I thank you so much for um, staying with me. Great, Marcus. Thanks for an excellent talk. So um, I'm just going to start reading out some of the questions that have already come through on the Slack channel. If you still want to ask questions, then go ahead and uh, please, yeah, thumbs up to any of the questions that are already there that you're uh, wanting to hear answers to. So one of our audience members says uh, that he's been looking at the protocols both in your paper and in the COVID-19 mass spec coalition. And he says, obviously, there are clear differences, but he's wondering whether you're keeping any spare plasma samples to be prepared in the future with perhaps more unified protocols. Or what do you think is the best way to deal with this if you're going to run thousands or tens of thousands in the near future? Yeah, so um, I'm of course the, the mass spec guy here. I don't have the oversight over the Charité uh, COVID-19 cohorts. No? As you can imagine, these are highly precious samples um, um, because they are very well clinically annotated. They have a, a good cohort. They started uh, when the pandemic came up here. So they are overrun by requests for the plasma samples. Yeah, so that's not for me to decide who, who can get them. Long story short, um, standardization um, is we have standardized our workflow to a very high extent. We orient on ISO certifications for medical devices. We are close to get an ISO certification of our workflow and we worked on this for many years to get to this level of documentation and certifications. So for us, it would not have been possible to quickly change this protocol. Now, also because we have designed this for achieving a CV value of, of five, six percent that we can run into diagnostic tests one day without pipeline. Whether this is the best way to go, um, for sure, uh, there are always many best ways to go. Yeah. So um, specifically in sample preparation, if you use different methods, you might see different things. So please don't stop using your established workflow just because I have published this one. Let's make many, uh, many parallel developments at the moment. And in a few years time, we will now know what works, uh, what works best. I hope this answers it uh, the best. So I, I can give you a strength and a weakness because that's a very important part of my talk. So the strength of our workflow is the CV values. Now we go down to 500 injections. We have a precision of 2% on the highest abundant proteins, 5% in total. This is at least 10 times better than what we had uh, before. 
A downside is uh, it makes only sense if you use a liquid handling robot, A. B, it only makes sense if you really run for very large studies because it's a lot of work to set it up. And third, it's not the cheapest workflow uh, on the market. And this is because we depend on 96 well SPME plates for sorry, our Sorry, Marcus, we just lost you for a second there. Oh, sorry. Could you just, just repeat the last sentence? You were just telling us it's not the cheapest. <laughs> it's not the cheapest because it depends on 96 well SPME uh, filter plates for the cleanup stage. And they cost something like 100 quid per plate. So this is most of the costs we create, and uh, but the advantage is that you get rid of batch effects. So if that's important for you, that's a very strong workflow to, to use. Great, thanks. Uh, so then we have another one come in that's asking if you're also going to run um, COVID urine studies uh, as well with your five minute pipeline, given that kidney injury seems to be an important aspect of the disease progression. Fully agree. We don't have a cohort at the moment, but I think urine proteomes for COVID-19 will be very informative in the in the future. Great. And then um, how does this scanning swath perform on longer gradients in comparison with the regular swath, say 100 variable windows? Mm. Scanning swath at the moment um, has its advantage clearly in the short gradients. Now, because then you achieve the very high sample complexity, then you can make fully use of the Q1 dimension. And this is where it's really strong. Yeah? Um, we haven't uh, in my lab spent a lot of time in, in testing how big improvements uh, you get on the long gradients. Yeah? Uh, but my gut feeling is the improvements where they really make a day night difference is the short gradients. And in the larger gradients, they will get you some improvement, um, but, but, but the big jumps uh, are for the short gradients. Great. And then one more um, quite uh, niche question, maybe. What's, what causes the divergent behaviour of the SAA1 in group three patients? It seems to behave in an opposite manner in around half of your cases. Yeah, well, not only in our cases, also in the, in the other studies. Um, confounders. We have old people in there, not so old people. There are different treatments that the physicians supplied. Now, as the cohorts get bigger, um, we probably can try to link this to the confounders, which may explain this behavior. And needless to say, those acute phase proteins like SA1, they are super important to uh, understand how the outcome of an individual will be. So um, I put the question back. So understanding this is one of the key elements to understand why some people will be more and other people will be less affected by coronavirus disease. Great. Um, I think that's uh, it for the, the popular questions on the Slack channel. Um, so thanks again, Marcus, for your time and the really interesting talk. Um, for the audience, as mentioned earlier, we will have a form uh, that you can scan for requiring a certificate of attendance. Um, and yeah, and thanks everyone for joining and our sponsors and the committee members for working away in the background to make sure that this webinar 